Welcome to My Life Chassidus Applied, episode 409. This program is dedicated by Tzipora Reitman and family in honor of Sora Gittel, Basraga Feivel, Shirley Jaffe's yard site on the 12th of Tammuz. So indeed, we are Erev Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tammuz, which is 95 years. Tafresh Pei the year 1927, was when the Afridi Rebbe was arrested for his counter-revolutionary activity in the former Soviet Union and uh, sentenced to death. He was arrested on the Te- Tezva of Sivan, on the 15th of Sivan, and he spent that time in prison. It was quite frightening and quite um, foreboding and ultimately was released on Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tammuz. First, it was a commuted sentence from death to exile in Kastarma, and then finally full release on the 12th and 13th. The reason the 13th of Tammuz, because that year was a holiday on the 12th of Tammuz, a secular holiday, so the offices were closed. So the bottom line was he was already released to be released on the 12th, but he actually left on the 13th of Tammuz. So we celebrate the Chaga Geula of Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tammuz. So we'll begin with that, being it's literally upon us, We'll also talk about this week is Pasha Bullock in uh, outside of Eretz Yisrael. We'll learn lessons and chassidus applied to Bullock, and and many other different topics, some follow-ups. So here's a good opportunity, first of all, to thank you all. I always thank you because this program would not be made possible, would not be possible without your support and help. First of all, the questions you submit. And you can submit any question, nothing is off, off limits, nothing is taboo, at chassidusapply.com. Secondly, for your support, your material support, financial support, your moral support, spiritual support, and it's a uh, partnership. It's really been appreciated by me and by my entire team. We're doing this already nine years, my life, Chassidus Applied. I never imagined that it would continue so long, but the questions kept pouring in, only growing and accelerating and the comments and the feedback, and thank God, God has blessed me and my t- wonderful team with um, the fortitude to forge ahead and to address all these questions, and I believe has opened up many new ways of looking at things. First of all, just the mere fact, as someone, a rabbi, a prominent rabbi, without mentioning names, told me, he says, the mere fact that people have a platform where they can ask questions, let alone the answers, is already gives people a certain vote of confidence, a certain encouragement that you're not stuck, you're not going to be silenced, you have a right to ask. Shalas Chochem Chetzi Tshuva, the question of a wise person is half an answer. And of course the answers themselves, and this has been for me a very growing and growthful experience, and I want to thank you for that. So with that, let's go straight into Yud Beis with Gimel Tammuz. Uh, being that this program is already running nine years, so you can imagine, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that I've discussed this topic more than once. So, but there's always more to learn from it and uh, even lessons from the past can be accentuated, can be nuanced, can be, uh, can always increase. As it is in Milan Bekedish, we always increase in holy matters. So let's start with what lessons does this day have for us? Most obvious question. 95 years ago, it was a different world, a different reality where the Jews were literally under a terrible oppression of a rising communist Bolshevik um, leadership and governance, government, after the following the Russian Revolution. So it was going from the frying pan into the fire. The Tsar wasn't exactly either easy. The pogroms, the anti-Semitism, the difficulties, the poverty, the discrimination. But the communists was far worse in many ways, where they went at an all-out war against religion. And the Friedrich Rebbe, of course, was a target. He was a major leader, if not the major leader of the Jewish people, especially in Russia. And he had this also st- stalwart, uh, stalwart and, and steadfast attitude that he would not give in and compromise in any way. So he was seen as an enemy by the communists, and especially by the Jewish communists, called the Yevsektsia. This was the Jewish the communist bureau, the Jewish Bureau of Communists, who had particular venom and hatred toward anything Torah-based, anything religious. They saw it as being antithetical to their progress and antithetical to the very vision of a Soviet Union, communism, and so on. 
So Friedrich Rebbe was ultimately arrested. And as I mentioned before, could have easily killed him. Chamon al-Islam. Indeed, in Tavshin Chav in 1967, when the Rebbe spoke about Yud Beis Tammuz, then was, uh, was 50, it was 40 years. Pezayin Sadiq, yeah. It was 40 years. The Rebbe spoke about 40 years, and he said, what was it so significant? He says, because it wasn't just a gu'ula for the moment. Had the Friedrich Rebbe, had they, put, they killed the Friedrich Rebbe, Chabad would have come to an end right there. There was no, the Rebbe wasn't yet Rebbe, the Rebbe wasn't yet a son-in-law, there wasn't the, the, the environment would, would, would have been impossible to just rebuild, as the Rebbe said. Nothing is impossible, but Bedera Chateva. So you based Thomas, the, the freedom, the liberation of Yud based Thomas, essentially, essentially continued maintaining a, a spirit of alive and that we're well and we will continue to build. And though it was difficult, ultimately Friedrich Rebbe came out of Russia, Soviet Union ended up in. Poland, and Europe, and then finally came to the United States in 1941. And yes, rebuilt. And look at what the Chabad is today. All that would not have happened if Yud Beis Thomas didn't happen. That's what the Rebbe said. He went even further and said something even more dramatic and radical, in a good way, that, that Yud Beis Thomas paved the way. Because any type of victory on a spiritual level changes the world. There's a paradigm shift. And it shifted and pa- changed the way that paved the way that ultimately would be easier for all the battles that the Jews would have to fight afterwards, he included the Six-Day War, which was in 1967. That Yud Beis Thomas opened the door in a certain way that made it easier for the weak victory that happened in the Six-Day War. So it just gives you context that this is not just a one-time event in history. Indeed, the Friedrich Rebbe writes in his famous letter the next year, Tafresh Peiches, the first anniversary, he writes, Loi oisi bulvad gol HaKadosh Baruch. I am not alone. I'm not. I alone was was liberated and redeemed, and freed on Yud Beis Thomas. But all those that love Torah and mitzvahs, and even the Jews that are B'shem Yisrael Yechuna, just called by the name Jew, because it demonstrated Yud Beis Thomas that Judaism can be victorious, even a great, mighty empire, the Soviet Union. Though it demonstrated for all of us that we have the power if we stand strong, and we are unwavering, that we will prevail. The story goes as the Friedrich Rebbe was in prison. So he would refuse to cooperate. He refused to speak Russian, though he was fluent in Russian. He insisted on having his talus and film. It was literally a threat to his, it was life and death. And one of the Yevsekhtia, who were grandchildren of the Tzemach Tzedek's Chassidim, pointed a gun to his head to the Friedrich Rebbe and said, this is a place where you listen to us, we don't listen to you. And this, this gun, this revolver, this pistol, has changed many people's mind. And the Friedrich Rebbe looked at him unflinching and said, this toy, this tzatzke, can, can, can frighten someone that has one world and many gods, but not someone that has one world, one god and two worlds, or many worlds. When you live in a materialistic life, he said, every day, whatever your taiva, whatever your desire, your indulgences are, that's your god for the day. But not someone who has one god and two worlds. You can't frighten someone like that. And then he responded to him, Rebbe, we will see who will prevail. Milzen vervet. He said in Yiddish. And the Rebbe answered, Yeah, milzen vervemen. We'll see who will prevail. And who prevailed? This man was killed shortly after. Friedrich Rebbe ultimately was liberated and came out of Russia. Difficult. He was tortured. He was hurt. But he came out. And the spirit was never weakened. Only stronger. And continued leading and ultimately rebuilt Chabad and Yiddishkeit in America. So the lesson to us is very clear. We all have challenges. We're not going to compare challenges. To compare would be almost ridiculous because compared to what was then, you're talking about living 24-7 in fear. You're living in a, a, a situation where you can't even just sit and study Torah or come together Shabbos or Fabrengen. You'd be arrested and very often killed. So we live in free times relatively. But we all have our challenges. And when you have a challenge, you may think it's an insurmountable one. Comes the Friedrich Rebbe and says, no, there's no challenge that can be overcome. It's all about your attitude, your spirit, your attitude. And when that is unwavering and unflinching, that can prevail over anything. So it's a tremendous lesson in fortitude, a tremendous lesson in resilience. 
So as we're 95 years later, we honor, we celebrate this special day to teach us what about Yud Beis Thomas today, what it means for us today. Can we learn anything from this liberation regarding the situation in Russia today? It's an interesting question. In 1990, the Soviet Union collapsed bloodlessly. The Rebbe made a big thing about it. There was a major watershed moment in history because the last major so-called um, oppressive empire of, that kept Jews and kept people in prison. You couldn't leave Russia. It was like a prison, one large prison. That could, fell, and the doors opened up, the gates opened, the Moscha Barzel, the Iron Curtain was pierced. And the Rebbe saw that as a historical moment leading us toward Mashiach. And we see in Russia, in Ukraine, in that whole region, a tremendous renaissance of Jewish life ever since. Tremendous. Anyone visits there is, is in awe. A place that was literally, did everything possible to obliterate godliness, Judaism, religion. I remember when my book was published in Russian, Toward a Meaningful Life. My book is filled with the references to God. So the translator, one of the translators told me, the word God became such a dirty word in Russia, in the Soviet Union, that when you use it in a book, it looks, sounds archaic, it sounds weird. So we found, I mean, we used it, obviously, because that was a significant part of the message. But it was interesting what he said. They literally, like, completely uh, uh, so um, besmirched and so uh, propagandized against God that the word itself was already, I mean, it's not just there, it's also in the West and many other places. We won't go into that right now. So can there any lessons be learned? Now we see it's since 1990, it's quite a while. It's 30, um, what is it, 34 year, 32 years later. And Russia's raging war against Ukraine, creating a disruption in the world. Thank God, Jews are not being blamed, are not being scapegoated. Jewish life continues. There's challenges, serious challenges. So I would say the lessons are, number one, what the Rebbe said in 1967 applies. Whatever prices were paid back in 1927, whatever prices are paid throughout history, it's never in vain. Every good deed, every sacrifice, every commitment, every blood, sweat, and tears that a human being and a Jew invested in his faith, or her faith, and beliefs, and values, bears fruit. It may not, you may not see the fruit immediately, but it will bear fruit. The fact that Russia collapsed, the Soviet Union collapsed, was not an accident. It's all part of a process, and perhaps that process began in 1927. And it's still impacting that part of the world. Just as the Baal Shem Tov's birth in Ukraine, the Rebbe's birth in Ukraine, that whole region, Russia, White Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Poland, all the areas there where Jews lived and our leaders lived, the Rabbeim who gave their lives for Yiddishkeit, for Chassidus. God forbid to say it was in vain. It refined the world. Just like when, when Moshe Rabbeinu looked at Eretz Yisrael, it refined the country and helped, as commentaries explain, helped them conquer the land, as we read in this week's chapters. So too the events, the Messiah Snefers that happened back in 1927, and before that, softened the resistance. So you'll say, one second, what horrible things happened. Okay, true. But you have to look at the big picture. The narrative. So the narrative is not over, my friends. Though what's happening now is disruption and very disturbing and all that, but the story is not over. So you base Thomas, yes, reigns supreme and continues to impact history. Our job is to make sure we hold on to that fire. We hold on to that, that steadfastness. We hold on to that, that, that resilience and absolute indestructible strength that only makes us stronger, that oppression and challenges only make us stronger. And we hold on to the promise that we will march to the Gula, the Jews everywhere, the entire world, including that part of the world, and everything will be redeemed. So the Gula of Yud Beis Tamas leads us to the bigger Gula, Hamitiz Vashleim. Okay. Which is also part of the theme of this week's Pasha, Bolok. So let's move from Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamas to this week's Pasha. What do we learn from this chapter? So the first thing we learn immediately, that negatives, that pure negatives can actually be the biggest positives. The whole story begins, Bolok, 
frightened by the Jewish people's arrival, hires, commissions Bilam, the prophet, to curse them. And instead of curses, what emerges from his mouth are blessings. God transformed. Bilam could not say anything that God did not tell him to say. So coming from him, it's even a greater blessing. Because if it comes from Moshe Rabbeinu, or from a source of light and source of holiness, okay. But You want to cut down a tree, you need the axe, the wood of the tree to cut down the tree. That's what an axe is made of. That's why the greatest prophecy says the Gemara Sanhedrin is from Avadja, because he was a ger, he was a convert. Meneir Be'aba. Bilam. Who, who prophesies about Mashiach and Gula? Bilam of all people. Even though it's hinted to in different words from Meshach Rabbeinu. But as the Rambam says, that Bilam prophesied. Mashiach, the Gemara, the Medr says, will come from Zdoim. Mashiach will come from suffering. Because the transformation of Mashiach is not just to shine light where there's light, but to transform darkness. So therefore it has to come from within the darkness. That's the ultimate. Yisr na'ir min ha'cheshach. Metoich ha'cheshach. That the greatest light is the one that comes from within the darkness itself. Classes I'm teaching these days in Ayin Beis, and I invite you all, it's a good opportunity to invite you, I have a daily morning class, live, on Zoom and YouTube, in Ayin Beis. So we're learning about different levels of transformation. It says the ultimate is transforming the Gvura from within, sweetening the severities, the judgments, the concealments, the darkness from within. And that comes from the greatest power of them all. So that's the first lesson. It's exactly the Yud based Thomas lesson. The darkness did not frighten the Friedrich Kareb. Could frighten someone that looks at the world in a very superficial or even not superficial, but materialistic way. But not someone that has more than one world, has one God and many worlds. And we see indeed the blessings, the, the, the curses were transformed into blessings. And what type of blessings? Aren of Layata. A vision of the future of Geula. Dorach Koich of Miyakov. That a star will rise from Yaakov, referring to Mashiach, as the Rambam explains in the end of Hilchus Melochim, chapter 11, how it's hinted to in, this, in these verses. So that's the first lesson we learn. The second lesson we learn is the other side of things that we are our own worst enemy. If you do what God said you to do, you fulfill your mission, no one can hurt you. Not Bilam, not Bullock, not any enemy. However, how then can we get hurt, get hurt when we allow ourselves to be exposed and vulnerable? What's the end of the story? The end of the Pasha, Bilam says to Bullock, it gives him the greatest gift. You want to curse the Jews, you can't curse the Jews. God protects them, they're his people. Blessings came out of me. As furious as Bullock was, and, and Bilam I'm sure also was, but that's what happened, blessings. You want to get to them. Have them hurt themselves. And he gave them the, he gave them the idea, a plot. Send the beautiful Midianite women, the Moabite, the Midianite women, down to the Jews. Let them seduce the Jews. And that's when they become vulnerable and exposed, and they will fall out of favor. And that's how you get to them. And that's indeed what happens. So someone asked the question like this. Bullock was an evil man because he wanted to annihilate the Jews. Bilam was unable to get the job done by, by cursing the Jews because his curses miraculously turned into blessings. Okay. But Bilam did earn his paycheck by giving Bullock great advice that if he was able to entice the Jews to participate in lewd, immoral behavior, that Hashem would be angry and do the annihilating himself. And the plan worked. Bullock sent prostitutes to the Jewish camp and Hashem was angry and sent a plague that killed many. The plague stopped when Pinchas took his actions to stop it. My question is this. Bullock's plot was genocide. The Jews sinned by consorting with, uh, the, the, with the inappropriate women. And that was enough for Hashem to send a big plague and score points for Bullock's team. Is the implication that participating in lascivious behavior is worse than committing genocide? Because after the Jews sinned, Hashem was so upset he sided with Bullock and allowed him to begin to see his plot of genocide come to fruition via heavenly plague. Well, the first response I would give is that when the Jews do something to themselves, it's like, I can protect you. We're in, we have a relationship, God says. But when you betray me, or when you open yourself up and you become weak, 
What am I supposed to do? You become your own worst enemy. And that's what happened. So yes, that opened them up to genocide, to being hurt. Thank God it wasn't on the level Bullock wanted. But nevertheless, it, it, it did cause that hurt. Now, it's due to their immoral behavior. And that is true. That is more powerful. When, when, when you do something, even though in life none of us are perfect, but when you behave in ways that are not appropriate, that's when you become more vulnerable. That's when you become more exposed and more susceptible to being hurt. So that's the general answer to this. Next question. What was the Messianic prophecy of Bilaam? And how is it relevant to, to us today as we are living in the beginning of the Messianic era? Well, exactly right. As the Rambam says, that the Torah refers to Mashiach. Nevi'im is filled with it. The prophecies are filled with references, but the Torah, Chumash, alludes to it. And it's meant to tell us how fundamental it is, and even Bilam said it, how fundamental it is that there is a purpose to existence, and we will realize and fulfill that purpose with the coming of Mashiach. So the verses are stated very clearly, and each verse gives us a different aspect. Mashiach's effect on the Jews, Mashiach's effect on the non-Jews, Mashiach's effect on the world. That's the verses. And the relevance is telling us that this we are waiting, and at this point, after all the thousands of years of hard work, we're at the threshold, the Rebbe tells us, to enter into the Messianic era that Bilam prophesied. And being that it comes from the darkness, from Bilam, it has the power to transform, not just to override, not just to bypass Golis, but transforming it from within. That Bilam himself, the ultimate archenemy of holiness and of Moshe and of the Jewish people, he's the one that prophesizes it. Okay, next question. What was the sin of Baal Pe'er and how does it apply today? Dear Rabbi Jacobson, when I was in yeshiva, we were taught the story that a Jewish man was once walking down the street and saw an aisle and wanted to make fun of the aisle, so he squatted over it and went to the bathroom on it. But afterward, he found out that what he did was the way the non-Jews worshipped it, so there was a debate if he was guilty of the Avera of Avedazara, of idolatry. What's really going on here? Why would a group of people worship an idol in such a disgusting manner, by defecating in front of it and so on? Is it possible that Baal Peir was just a celebration of physicality? And the problem with it, aside from it being disgusting, was that the Moabites refused to acknowledge the spiritual part of Hashem and His Torah? Are some of the immoral behaviors being publicized and normalized in today's society a modern-day form of Baal Peir worship? And what can we do to offset it? So Chassidus doesn't need to explain. Because you think, why would anybody worship something like the waste, defecation, and behave that way? But you have to remember, waste is a byproduct, a byproduct of a material world. And when you don't, when you confuse means and ends, then you can start the worshiping the mean, the means, and not the end. The waste is a, meant to be thrown out. When you start worshiping waste, it's like saying, in the word of, words of Chassidus, that you're taking the psalas, the waste, which is the klippa, and worshiping money as an end in itself, worshiping materialism as an end in itself. When that's only a waste. That's only an external. It's like someone has a, has, has a fruit, an orange and an orange peel. And instead of taking the fruit and, and valuing it, you throw out the fruit and you worship the peel. That's essentially the concept. A complete distortion of what is pr- primary and what is secondary. So waste is a byproduct. It, it does eliminate waste. It's important also in this world. In an imperfect world, we have to eliminate waste. But when you start worshipping the waste, you're like worshipping materialism as an end in itself when it's only meant to be a means to spiritual growth. That's the essence of it. And it's a terrible clipper. And that was Baal Peir. Today, you see, a materialistic world does worship. They may not call it waste. Yes, it may not be waste in the defecation the context of it. And pardon the expression if it offends anyone. But it's waste in other ways. It doesn't always have to look like it. It doesn't always have to smell like it. It's just waste because it's not an end in itself. It's only a means to something else. And yes, what can we do about it? The answer is to focus on what God wants of us. You eat a meal. The goal is not that the meal, the, 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 the waste of the meal or the things that you throw out. It's to take the energy that is derived from the food, the nutrients that become part of your flesh and blood. And let it strengthen you to do a mitzvah, to do a good deed, to study. That's the ultimate goal. That's the way we should look at it. 
And that's the tikkun for any, where we, anyone who worships materialism or waste, the tikkun, the repair for that, the best way to heal is by showing what is the ikkah, what is the primary thing, what is the fruit, and what is the, the extra, the extraneous stuff. Simple, simple approach to that. Okay. Finally, at the end of the story, we find that Zimri takes Kuzbi Basur, she was the daughter, a princess of one of the Midianite kings, and they behave in an extremely immoral way in, in the public, desecrating God. So it says Pinchas came and he s- spared them. So someone asked, was Pinchas stabbing Kuzbi through her stomach with a spear a primordial form of abortion? No, I would not say that exactly. He speared them both, and um, we all know that it was an act of zealotry, but it was rewarded, as we see in the next chapter. God gave him the covenant of peace. Now he behaved like a zealot. Why is he getting the covenant of peace? Because Pinchas was a peaceful man. For him, what he could not tolerate, he was not a violent man, he wasn't aggressive, not even in Gedusha. But when he saw such a desecration by a one of the tribe leaders, the leader of Shimon, of the, the tribe of Shimon, that Zimri, and doing it in public, he didn't even wait. And it's important to know that lesson as well. So instead of calling it an act as you describe it, I would say it was a way of, of sanctifying God's name. But that doesn't mean we can take the law in our own hands. This is a one-time exception, a certain act of kanois, kanoyim poigimbe. So I, that answers your question, but the deeper point of it is that he has stabbed them in the, through and through because that was where the heart of their essence of what they were sinning about. It was their sexuality. So he pierced them close to that area to d- d- demonstrate what they did was such a t- horrible crime. Okay. With that, let's move on to a follow-up to last week's Pasha. There were three questions that came in on Chukas. As I've said, many questions come in all the time. Sometimes they come in a day, a day after the Pasha, like the day after I, or like in the case, let's say, when I speak today, Sunday, so this is usually about Bullock, but sometimes questions are still remaining from previous weeks. So from time to time, I cover something as a follow-up. So let's do a few questions on Chukas, and then some more timely matters. Okay, many of the commandments, um, what's it, Chukas... Do the super-rational chukim come from a higher spiritual source? Many of the commandments we do because we believe in the Torah. However, some of the commandments we would follow, even without a Torah, because they make logical sense. As the Gemara says, Il mole and the Rebbe Rashab adds, If the Torah was not given, we'd learn sneers from a cat, and so on. Many atheists don't steal or murder, not because they believe in God, but because they think it's just the correct way to behave in society. The difference is with chukim. Without a Torah telling us, there would be no way we could figure out on our own not to wear shatnas, for example. Linen and wool. Only the Torah can tell. Chukim. Do the group of mitzvahs called chukim come from a higher spiritual source because they seem super rational? The answer is absolutely yes. I believe I spoke about this the week of chukas, that there are the three categories of mitzvahs, the logical, rational ones, the commemorative ones, and the chukim. The chukim are actually a representation that the truth is we don't understand even the ones that we understand with logic. There's always something that's beyond the logic. Is logic logical, as I once explained, once wrote about? But the chukim are open and apparent divine edicts because only God could have said them. And that's exactly their point, to teach us that we sometimes have to accept and surrender and commit to something greater than our minds. And that's what chukim are. So that's correct, and it's explained in many different places. I discussed it in the context of a chukim from the word chekike, engraved. Okay. Another question that in Parsha Chukas we started reading earlier as well and later as well, how the Jews are marching toward the promised land. So the big question that comes up is how did they have a right to go into the prom- into Yisrael and banish and even kill all the men, women, and children? to just con- conquer the land for themselves. What right did we have to enter the land of Canaan and murder men, women, and children and steal the land and then have the chutzpah to portray the Emirate qu- kings, Sichon and Eg, as the villains for merely standing up and defending themselves and their land? Perhaps we were the villains. 
Could you imagine if the Torah was written today by Russian scribes and they wrote Hashem said to Putin to command the Russian troops to march into Ukraine and decimate them and then they also wrote that the Ukrainians who fought back to defend themselves are the bad guys. Okay. So this is a question I have addressed. I've even written some articles on it because when you read it ostensibly it sounds completely unfair. Same as the story with obliterating Amalek. With the seven nations and cannot. So firstly, go to MeaningfulLife.com meaningful and just look up this, I think it was called Religious Violence. And you'll see a longer explanation, which I'm not going to go to in here in detail. But bottom line, remember this. The Torah is a Torah is chesed. A, divine, a, a, a Torah given to us, a Torah of love. Given to us by the source of love, God. A Torah of life. So there's no way the Torah is coming to tell us to do something that's not chesed. And if we don't understand, it means we need to dig deeper. So the question is a good question, but we have to understand the context. And when you know the context, it changes the whole picture. These nations that occupied Eretz Yisrael, or Eretz Canaan, were not innocent nations. You have to remember that Avraham Avinu spent a lot of money and time in inheriting and purchasing parts of Eretz Yisrael for himself and for his family, for his children. And Yitzchok lived there, and Yaakov lived for a while, but then they had to run down because, to eat because of the famine. And it was very, everyone knew that Yaakov owned the land. Definitely parts of the land where he lived. But the neighbors, okay, it's like someone moving out because they had to go due to an emergency. They had to go to Egypt. They didn't want them back. This was not their land, it's Jewish land. And that's why when the Jews come back, they give them ample warning. It's not just go kill anyone randomly and rampantly. They gave them warning and they wrote letters, as the Rambam says, one letter, two letters, three letters. It was their land. If someone like, for example, you own the house, you have a deed to it, then for whatever reason you have to leave. And what happened is squatters entered and they decided it's their, it's their home. You come back 100 years later, or here in this case, hundreds of years later, I don't know you. Who are you? So there's not just some innocent people living there. And they were given opportunity and different options. This was the land of the whole world, like Rashi says in the beginning of Chumash. What does he say? Nachlas Goyim. Los Islam Nachlas Goyim. Why does the Torah begin with Bereshis? Because the Abish is telling, he gid lehem, that, Nachlis, that the Abish took the land. He gave the land, he created the world, and then Bereshis bar Lakim, and then he gave Eretz Yisrael to the Jewish people. The rest of the world he gave to the other nations. So it was a very fair. The Jews got a small little sliver of land. So let them have what they were given. And the fact that they yell, list them at them, you're thieves, that's why we have the preemptive answer. That's the expression, the posuk. The power of his actions, creations, God told his Amit, his nations, that I've given you this land. So when you understand that context, it's a whole different story here. And from this you can apply it to other scenarios where it may appear that the Jews are aggressors or doing something inappropriate when in truth it was defense or completely moral and ethical and the way they did it. You know that in Jewish law there's only, only law of, of, war, of war law that only in Judaism that when you surround a city you always have to leave a back door open so people can escape. So people can escape. Which, which nation, which army did you ever hear that does such a thing? You surround them, you want to destroy them. You want them to surrender. Because we're not looking for blood, we're not looking for war, we're looking for yesha, for truth and integrity and what God wants of us. Another question on the last, next week's, last week's Pasha was when the Jews were praying for water and they got the water from the rock. So then they sang Shira Sabe'er. What was the song of the well? Hi, Rabbi. What was the song of the well? Do we still know the words and tune to the song? What is the relevance of the Torah writing this event? Are we supposed to sing a song every time we find water? So we know the words because they're there in the Pasuk. Alai Ba'er. Did I sing? That the Ba'er, the, the, the fountain, the, the fountain, the well should rise. A song? Well, we know the Kriya, the Trap. Is there a song associated to it? I don't know if there's a song that's passed on from back then. But just like Oz Yosher is also a song. 
Do we know the exact tune besides again, the trop, how to read it in the Torah? And the point is, yes, water is the, the essential sustenance of a human being. And we always look at it as, as bracha, as a simen bracha. Famous statement from the Baal Shem Tov, when you see a body of water, say that the Baal Shem Tov said that, when you see a body of water, say it's a simen bracha. But this bracha goes all the way back. Water is necessary. Food is also necessary, but water is absolutely necessary, and you can't live without three days without going without water. In Ruchni Yismayim represents chesed, love. Of course, it's the essence of what sustains us. Love is like oxygen to the soul, to the human being, to the human emotions. Okay, so we covered some of the, um, we covered some things in Bolak and Pinchas. Let's now move to other questions, some timely ones. Dr. Zelenko, all of us shalom. So he just passed away. He was quite well known, especially during covid and um, so some people adamantly agreed with him, some adamantly disagreed. But now his neshama has moved on, tragically, 49-year-old young man. And we obviously grieve for him and his family, and I believe there's a fund that you can support to help his family get on. You can look up online. So here one person asked, Dear Rabbi Jacobson, sometimes we can disagree with people but still like them and appreciate all the good within them. An example is Dr. Zelenko, who sadly passed away this week. I personally felt in the last year he subscribed too deeply to conspiracy theories. But in no way does that change how I feel about him as a great Jew and a great human being, even though I disagree on one issue. He healed many sick people, and he was dedicated to our community, just like Dr. Feldman was. They were both highly skilled doctors and amazing people who sadly were taken from the world too early. May Hashem comfort and bless their families. And may, the only, and may they only have good news and simchas to share with the community. So I second that as well, that even if we may have different agreements, we always value people for the good things they have done. And especially now that Neshama has gone on, moved on to the next level. As I said, I'm mentioning it also in his honor, but also in the honor of his family. So if you can help support, please go. I believe it's, um, you can find it online, just write Dr. Zelenko, um, Razathon and find there the fund that is supporting him and his, fam- his family to be able to grow and uh, continue on. And may they be um, com- comforted. May they be comforted with all the others that are grieving Zion and Jerusalem. And may we only know Simchas, everybody in healthy ways, and be able to march to Mashiach without any more anguish, pain, suffering, death, illness, death, and so on. Okay. And merit to the day where all death will be swallowed up. God will erase the tears and all death will be swallowed up forever. Okay. To moving on to Gimel Tammuz. Gimel Tammuz follow-up. Do you have any insight what we should be doing other than what we have already been doing for the past 30 years? So a person writes the following. Musings from our Gimel Tammuz for bringing to achieve virtual mashpia of the multiverse. Shalom of Rach. Yeah, I'm familiar with this title. It's been, uh, you've written to me in the past. During our Gimel Thomas Fabrengen, despite 28 years passing, I realize that most are still in the first stage of grief, some form of denial. The Rebbe is still with us. Look how much Chabad has grown. Look how the younger generation is connected to the Rebbe, and so on. It all felt so last year and every year since Gimel Thomas. The only chord that really struck me was the following question, which no one had an answer to. The Rebbe told us that we should gather a few people together and figure out what to do in order to bring Mashiach. 30 plus years have passed, so obviously we haven't hit upon the solution. The question was, what can we do in order to prevent the 29th, 30th, etc. Hilula, where we gather at the same shul for the same recycled fabreng? The only idea someone had was to follow the lead of Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis in their straightforward straightforward and strong approach to spreading good values. We should do the same with Yiddishkeit. Do you have any insight what we should be doing other than what we have already been doing for the past 30 years? Or maybe just an attitude change in the way we live? Any ideas? So frankly, and I'm not trying to toot my horn here, but something I've been talking about for 30 years and continue to do so, and I do believe we have to look at ourselves. The Rebbe did give us those marching orders. 
And doing the same thing, that's what they call insanity, doing the same thing and expecting different results. Now, I don't need to look at Trump or DeSantis. We need to look into Torah and that precedes them. And we see from the Rabbim what to do. Forge ahead. Create new initiatives. We're not talking about new as in crazy or radical. We're talking about new initiatives of taking Yiddishkeit, Torah, mitzvahs, making it relevant, applying it to life, making it mainstream, showing people how the best way to live is to live a godly life. It's the healthiest way to live. What better way to prepare a world, a world where materialism will not be an end in itself, but lo and the entire business of the world will only be to know God, by knowing God now, as much as we can, but making it relevant, highly relevant. That's where I feel is lacking most. I think people have good intentions, different efforts have been made, but that to create a true paradigm shift, to actually move the needle where you can infiltrate the world, a critical mass with this approach to life is what's lacking. That's what we must do. And that has not been done in the last 30 years. Again, here, bit and there. I have done some things, but I don't see myself as a success story, frankly. Why? Because there's a big world out there. Success is not just what you've done in the past, but what, well, how much more there is to do. And the Rebbe wanted a world change. And a world change requires your futsa minus chutza in a completely new global way. That's the thing I emphasize. This doesn't take away from all the activities that Shluchim and others do locally in their own area and their own families and communities. Remember, you change yourself, you change the world. It all starts that way. But today with technology and other means, we have the opportunity to reach far beyond. And it's not a numbers game, it's just that when people, when it becomes something popular, fashionable, that many people do, it's far more likely that they'll hold on to it, they'll be interested. It'll intrigue people. That's the key challenge. And that's frankly the challenge of my work, is essentially that. How do you reach a critical mass? How do you infiltrate chassidus? And in a way that's not just infiltrate, in a way that it's embraced, because it's a true model for the best and healthiest type of living. Okay. Talking about that, here's another interesting question. What is a Lubavitcher? Hi, Rabbi. I often have conversations with other Bali Tshuva, many of whom struggle greatly with finding their own derech, their own path. They feel attracted to Chabad as they were inspired by Chabad, but they don't know that the Chabad lifestyle is necessary. They don't know that whether the Chabad lifestyle is necessarily for them. I always tell people that the movement is called Chabad, Labavitch, because there's two aspects to it. Chabad represents the Torah of Chassidus, and Labavitch represents the Ashkofa and worldview. I explain it that not everyone is meant to be Dafka, Crown Heights, or Lubavitcher. The lesson from the seven branches of the menorah representing different paths in Avedis Hashem. But no Jew can deny the Torah of the Rebbe and, the, on, on, and that of all the other Rabbim as the Torah that, that, the Torah that will bring us to Mashiach. Chassidus, yeah. As far as I know, I thought of this on my own, but I'm worried I might be misleading people since you... Since, if you dig a little, a, little bit, a little bit deeper into it, the Torah of Chabad Chassidus speaks clearly about a Chassid Rebbe relationship, which is the essence of being a Labavitcher. Being Mekusher, attached, connected to the mindset of the Rabbeim, which is the mindset of Temchit Mim and Labavitch. What are your thoughts about this? Is it accurate to claim that Chabad and Labavitch are separate for the sake of helping a person find their derech, their path? Or is it misleading them? And the Chachila, I should speak about how Chabad Torah is for everyone, Initially speak how Chabad Torah is for everyone and how it circles directly into the Chassid Rebbe relationship. Thank you so much. So, a few comments. I would not make this distinction the way you did about Chabad Labavitch. To me, they're both the same. They emphasize different points. Chabad is more the acronym of Chachma Bin Adas. Labavitch means love. But that's the whole point of Chabad Chassidus, which is a universal approach for all people. It's not a maflega, as the Rebbe Rashab, as the Alter Rebbe said. It's not a party. To, to align their minds, their cognitive and their emotions and their behavioral toward the mission and the divine mission in this world. So it's two different aspects. To say one is the Torah of Chassidus, the other is Ashkaf and worldview. The Torah of Chassidus is Ashkaf and worldview. It's also a perspective. It is a perspective and worldview. Part of it is also the concept of a Rebbe and a Chassid. You may have wanted to say really that there's two parts of Chabad as in we'll call it cultural Chabad. Or you could even say corporate Chabad. That's more so-called Chabad as a brand, but that's not the Ashkof and the Torah of Chabad. 
The Torah of Chabad is for everybody, and that includes Chabad and Labavitch. Now, as far as how people embrace it where they have to live in Crown Heights, no, where does it say that a Chabad person has to live in Crown Heights? I know Chabad people that don't even look like a card-carrying member, but they embrace that philosophy, that approach. The approach that what? That we are here, our souls come down to this, came down to this world to illuminate the world with the divine and turn the world into a home for God, a garden, Bosilagani. And people do it differently. There are people who do it as rabbis and rabbitsons. There are people, shluchim and shluchis. People who do it as professors and scientists. And people who do it as lawyers, doctors, and accountants. So there are many ways to do this, in integrating it into your life. And a Lubavitcher is that. It's not a, it's not a card-carrying member. It's not a political thing. It's not a, even a corporate or brand-oriented thing. Definitely not cultural. Are there, is a culture com- connected to it? Yes, their cultural behavior, the way people dress. But above all, it's a Teda movement. It's a Teda movement. Mesha gave us a Teda. A Teda is God's blueprint for life. Chesidus is a part, is the premius at Teda. It's the soul of that Teda. And teaching us all, Jews and non-Jews for that matter, and all people of all walks of life, how to live our lives the way God wants us and prepare the world for the world of, the world of, of Bala Oriz Deus Hashem, Kamayim Layam Achasim a world filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. There's another follow-up, a July 4th follow-up. So on July 4th, I discussed, I believe, last week and also on different programs. I do many programs. I can't always <laughs> remember where what. But the Torah roots for the Independence Day, for the ideas that the Founding Fathers um, presented in the Declaration of Independence, in the, in the Constitution, and so on. Did the Torah inspire the Founding Fathers? So here's the question. Here's the comment. Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. I've been reading On Two Wings, Humble Faith and Common Sense at the American Founding by Michael Novak. That's a book I was suggesting, I've suggested many times. And I've been again struck by the belief in divine providence of the founders. To quote, to quote John Witherspoon in 1776, the doctrine of divine providence extends not only to things which we may think of as a great moment and therefore worthy of notice, but the things the most indifferent and inco- the, 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 but the things that are even most indifferent and inconsiderable, quote unquote. He is among the many founders who believed in and preached the idea of Ashgacha Pratis, divine providence, to the Balshemtiv. Prior to the Balshemtiv, it seems that in Judaism the belief was in Ashgacha Klolis and not Ashgacha Pratis. Well, the Rebbe has a whole letter about that, a whole essay. It's not exactly, perf- exactly correct. There are many that did believe in Ashgach Pratis, but okay. And it was the innovation of the Yisrael, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tev, that there was Ashgach Pratis. How did the founder, founders reach the same idea as the Baal Shem Tev when they weren't in Eastern Europe? One thought I had was after reading Sefer HaZachrenus, the memoirs of the Friedrich Rebbe, where we're told that Rabbi Moshe, the great-grandfather of the Alter Rebbe, traveled to England and published books on Judaism in English. Is it possible that these books were the inspiration for the Founding Fathers? While he was an avowed misnagid, I wonder if he wrote about this. He was living at the same time as the Baal Shem Tov. Also, also, do you know if these books are extant? Are they in the Rebbe's library? Okay, that's very interesting. I have never thought of that, but it's very possible. Remember, the Founding Fathers and many other scholars, especially in those, middle, those ages, that period of time, were exposed to the Bible, especially many of them studied Hebrew. And a lot of discussion, and on two wings he really covers it well. There's another book called The Hebrew Republic, and some other books and essays that explain that they were very much exposed. Now, did that mean they heard it from the Baal Shem Tev? Remember, Ashgach HaPratis existed before the Baal Shem Tev, as I mentioned in the Rebbe's essay that's printed in uh, now, it's printed in Igris Kedis probably, but it's in Echelik Ches. Lekut HaSich is volume 8, and the Hesophis, Shvuz, it's a whole essay the Rebbe speaks about Ashgach Pratis, the different opinions on the matter. So of course they were familiar with divine providence. First of all, even when you read Chumash, you see divine providence. The hand of God leading the Jews out of Egypt and every detail that, God's, that God is guiding them. And this was what they was their model. They actually have the model of some of their symbols. It was the model of, the, of God leading them through the wilderness with a pillar of fire and the pillar of the cloud, leading them through the challenges. And they compared their challenges to those challenges. Okay. So it's not a surprise to find all that in the Founding Fathers. There are many places. Can we actually trace what they read, what they didn't read? That's what these books and other books do, studies and research on this topic. But thank you for that. 
And again, I addressed it uh, last week. I addressed it also in a program, a radio program I did last week about the Jewish roots for, of the founding fathers. And other, plenty of other times I've written and talked about this many times. Yeah. Another follow-up to the issue of secular studies. You know, questions keep coming in on this topic, so let me do a few more. And I try to move through all of them. So here's the question. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, thank you so much for your ongoing weekly video casts. In your most recent episode, you discussed chinuch and secular education and explained that secular education can be added in with tutors. I don't know if you meant this genuinely or not, but it's the most unrealistic expectation. But it is the most unrealistic expectation. Once our boys are in middle school, the hours at school don't have time for tutoring. Certainly not on any serious level. This adds to the fact that our kids don't have any meaningful sports activities other than some recess, certainly no organized sport. If you want to say that reading and writing in English, math, civics, and government, and sciences aren't important, I could understand that argument, although I disagree. I disagree. But to say that the boys are supposed to come home from school and immediately start tutoring, and that is a serious way for them to get a secular education, feels either out of touch and unrealistic and or quite disingenuous to me. So the, my point was not about the tutoring per se. The point was that uh, healthy parents and responsible parents are going to give their children a education that we also learn. There are things you learn in school and what the priorities, especially as the Rebbe wanted, Lemude Kedish. But things like spelling, writing, mathematics, basic things, just like you teach someone to drive a car or to ride a bicycle. The tutoring could be, parents can do the tutoring, or it could be getting a tutor. It wasn't, I wasn't getting into is there time or not time. It's, if it's important, you'll figure it out. I know many students, many, many people in yeshiva, boys and girls who are taking piano lessons or violin lessons or other, or go to sports. So when someone considers something important, you do it. So I was saying you can figure it out. This is not about, the key thing the Rebbe was avoiding was worshiping, was worshiping tachlis, that you can't exist, you can't survive without a, a intense secular education, getting a degree, and so on. That was the main point. Another question, there are so many Jews that contributed to society through business, science, and philosophy, etc. And as a result, they've built many companies, discovered cures for illnesses, and developed new methods to help society. But almost all of these Jews have been secular, and it was due to their secular and scientific education. Wouldn't it be appropriate for all Jews to study similar subjects, so they can all contribute to society. And if Jewish children aren't taught these subjects, isn't that a terrible thing as it prevents them from their possible contributions to society? Well, I believe I answered this question preemptively last week. We are teaching our, let's make this clear. It's not that, that the people studying secular sciences have a, a monopoly on contributions to this world. I would say the exact opposite. They contribute certain things. But what about contributing the value system? Guidance and direction. I mentioned soul doctors. We live in a world that is bereft of spiritual direction and guidance. Psychological, emotional, healthy approach to life. Now that's what we're teaching our children. When we teach them Torah, it's not some abstract or detached Torah. Torah is teaching us lessons of guidance in life. How to be, have to be, how to be smart. How to be emotionally intelligent how to be psychologically intelligent, how to be a healthy person, not driven by fear and insecurities. I would submit if Torah was taught properly, we would be able to prevent most of therapy because that's what it teaches you, to be a healthy person. So if it's taught that way, it's absolutely necessary. If we sent our children now, they become competitors to accountants and lawyers and doctors and scientists, what would happen with all the deeper values that we need, the spiritual soul doctors that we need? And that's, we have, we're literally living in a time where there's so few of them. If you're a responsible person and you knew there was a city that had thousands of lawyers and thousands of doctors and thousands of accountants, and someone says, I need to become an accountant. We say, we have enough accountants. We need a soul doctor. There's no one in town that's a soul doctor. There's no one that you can go speak to about my life, about my marriage, about my family, about my children, people in pain, people who've gone through abuse, people who've gone through different challenges, people who have grief. And I don't just mean negative things how to live the best possible life, how to balance career and home, how to balance vacation and transcendence, 
how to in general live a life, a wholesome life that feeds your soul as much as your body. Who's going to teach that? That's what our yeshiva system is meant to be. And that's precisely why there may not be a perfect balance, because we need to balance out. There's so much focus on that side of the scale and too little focus on spiritual guidance. Well, we need to realize that a soul doctor is just as valuable as a medical doctor, if not more so. And even medicine recognizes today that you need to have that spiritual sense of life, sense of purpose, mission, sense of urgency, sense of belonging, sense of, uh, of, of feeling indispensable. That's also part of being a healthy person. Okay. With that, let's segue into another question, which is also follow-up, some follow-ups. I see I can deal with some follow-ups, thank God, because I like to catch up. There's a lot of backup here. So we go like this. Healing from abuse. Dear Rabbi, first I want to thank you for answering my question. I feel odd and silly now that it seems so important that it seems so important at the time. Of course, Hashem created the months with their energy since he created the universe and the moon. So this is a question from at least six episodes back. So I asked about did God create also the months and not just the weeks and the days. So of course Hashem created the months with their energy since he created the universe and the moon, as you explained, meaning I explained back in that episode. But somehow I feel reassured to know that I'm wrapped in God's time. Maybe my question was just an excuse to tell you how important your teachings, your humility, generosity, and deep knowledge were for me. You are God's messenger. I have your book also, of course, and the Omer app. Thanks to you, I am afloat now. I'm not drowning anymore. I fought the angel and I won. I have to say it is a lonely path. I am the only one who identifies as a Jew in my family. My Jewish grandmother came from Bratislava from an assimilated family. She flew Europe at the beginning of the Second World War and took the last boat to Israel. Her sister and parents were taken to to Theresienstadt, which was one of the camps. But it was already 1945. Auschwitz was liberated by the Russians. No convoys were sent there anymore, so they survived. She married a Palestinian Catholic, my grandmother, and had three daughters with him. She left him when the kids were young and came to Montreal. She took them back when they were teenagers. They hated her with all their hearts. They were raised anti-Jewish. The bad Jews and the good Palestinians. I was raised the same. My grandmother eventually got remarried to a Jewish man. I decided to go back to Judaism when the rabbi in my community in his eulogy said that we were a Jewish family. He thought that one of the daughters will answer this, his call, but I was the one who came to see him. I was 36 years old at the time, already married in a church with one daughter. I did my bat mitzvah at his synagogue. Little did I know that the journey would be so long. He told me at the time, Judaism is not a state of mind, but a state of being. I was kidnapped at 10 years and molested for an afternoon. The trauma was never treated. I self-medicated in my 20s with drugs and promiscuity and clubbing. I stopped cold turkey when I got married to a non-Jewish man. But the trauma was still latent, like an undetectable poison in my veins, polluting my mind, my body, and my soul. I divorced my husband. He was not a good man. Six years ago, I lost the contracts that I had with the government since 10 years. My place, the landlord wanted to give it to his son. Everything crumbled. The house of cards. I didn't know how to get through. I was praying Hashem to help me. I started watching videos of rabbis on YouTube and I found you. Guided by him, you helped me build a foundation which I never had. You helped me feel secure which I never felt. All that to say I came a long way and it is all thanks to you. It's only the beginning. I go from beginning to beginning, the spiral of time. I truly believe now that all can be good. I truly believe now that all can be good and all can be bad. It depends what you do with the situation. Losing everything six years ago allowed me to start anew with a clean slate to reach within, deepen my soul. I'm protected by Abraham's shield now. I am safe. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, thank you. Very touching. In any way I could be of help, please stay in touch. And I, uh, whatever I can do, I will be there. So in this, those weeks, I was also discussing abuse, healing, and different forms of healing. So I want to read another follow-up on that. And with that, I think we'll cover what we have to cover this week's episode. Abuse, healing, and homeopathy. Can abuse itself be transformed into healing? 
On your discussion of the violation of children, I had the privilege to work as a homeopath with such a person, a woman, who clearly remembers her father abusing her countless times while she was in her childhood. And her mother ignored his behavior as, as she had no choice. She had multiple personalities, and with Hashem's help, we were able to reduce them down to three, four, in less than a year. She had no animosity toward her father. That's the daughter we're talking about. And even create, created a successful charity in his name. She eventually got married before her treatments and had several children which, with severe emotional issues. One was brilliant and got scholarships to study at renowned yeshivas and became a rab- at a renowned yeshiva and became a rabbi and moved to Israel where he still lives with his family. When, we, when she told him how well she's doing through homeopathy, he told her it was evil and that I was a witch and demanded that either she stop the treatments or never see her grandchildren. So he stopped. Homeopathy is based on Torah events, golden calf, grind golden calf into powerful till it is fine enough to diffuse into amount of water. Interesting, homeopathic gold is the remedy for spiritual depression. Next example, the bitter waters, a bitter tree was thrown into the bitter lake and the waters became drinkable. All this was done by the word of God. The beams of the tabernacle were made from the wood. Hahnemann, the founder, one of the founders of homeopathy, lived in Germany at the same time as the Alter Rebbe. He wrote and spoke six languages, Aramaic, Hebrew, English, French, Greek, and Latin. He trained as a chemist doctor. He became dissatisfied with bleeding. He decided to learn how God heals and using those principles, developed them into homeopath- homeopathic treatments by testing dangerous substances on his student volunteers. Minimum of six asked to take a drop of the remedy once a day that had been diluted by a process called secused and diluted again up to six times so that only a minute quantity remains and the energy that this process produced. These students knew how to, knew how to keep meticulous records. He also tested the remedy on himself. He then organized the findings into a material medical. Each remedy acted on almost every organ of the body and system categories to over 15 chapters. Mind, emotions, skeletal, muscular, nerves, food, sleep. He stressed that all disease, not ailments, are a result of a person's disconnect with God, with Hashem. He proved his work when Germany was at war with Austria and was asked by the king of Austria, who he had healed, to help his soldiers troubled by dysentery, of which there were over 17,000, and he helped them with two remedies from one symptom, better or worse. No one died. Not one died. Today I use a derivative of homeopathy as it is illegal where, where, illegal where, I've call, where, where, where I live, called healing with cell stol- salts, of which there are 12. These control most functions in the body and are in every cell of one's body. These are absorbed by plants. And God created Abraham from the salt of the earth, uh, Adam, Adam from the salt of the earth. Interestingly, Hanuman is similar to Neman in the book of the prophets who had a poor skin condition, to Neman, whose Jewish maidservant told him to go to Alicia. I am happy to answer whatever I can. Yours, a follower of you and of the Rebbe. Okay, I read this because I know there are some people who have written to me about homeopathy and I just felt I'd put it out there. Somebody wants more information, wants to make a connection with this person, just write to us at chsidasupply.com. And finally, Baruch Hashem, I found the, way, the amazing letter from a survivor that you quoted about 46 minutes into episode 396, which was broadcast on the 25th of other two, the Rebetzin's birthday, full of blessings and inspiration to carry on and help Mashiach come. Please let him know, meaning me, please let Rabbi Jacobson know he has made a tremendous positive difference toward healing for others and Mashiach for all. I am so grateful. Mashiach now. Also, at about 43 minutes into episode 396, very special to hear someone else in the process of growing through challenges, and all the comments and answers are valuable. So these are more comments. I don't need to really comment on the comments. I thank you for the comments. What I will say is what I said at the outset of the program. This is a living program. I personally am extremely gratified by the interactivity to be a platform for people's questions and also people's thoughts and feelings. And it's an open forum, so please don't, please take advantage and don't hesitate to write us anything that's on your mind. I really appreciate it. So with that, we'll conclude this My Life Citizen Applied episode 409, going into Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamas. May we all have liberation, spiritual, physical, psychological, emotional liberation from all our 
challenges from all the difficulties within and without. And may we march to the Gula Amitiz Vashlemen this month of Tammuz. Next Shabbos will be the 17th of Tammuz, but it's Nitche because it's Shabbos, so it's pushed off to Sunday. And as the, the Gemara says, and, and, the, the, and the Rebbe Marash and the Rabbeim interpret, Kivin the Itche Itche, since it was pushed off, may it be pushed off completely. May these days be transformed. These, these, uh, these days of, of sadness, maybe they be transformed to, to celebrations and joy and jubilation in the Geula Hamitiz Vashlema. We are here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. This has been My Life Chassidus Applied. Thank you so much. Maybe have a blessed week. This program is brought to you by My Life Chassidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapplied.com donate.